This is going to be an overview of the book of Nehemiah. While Ezra is a picture of the believer's body being the temple of the Holy Ghost, Nehemiah is a picture of sanctification after your body becomes the temple. It pictures getting the outer man fixed. See, when you get saved, your body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you need to live your life like it's the temple of the Holy Ghost. You need to separate yourself from the sinful activities of this world. You're going to see in this book, when Nehemiah begins to build those walls and gates, that there is people trying to stop him. Just like people are going to try to stop you from getting your outward man fixed. The devil will throw things in your way to keep you from building a hedge around you and cause you to, de to defile your temple. You're going to find that people are going to come in your life to try to keep you from doing right. They're going to try to get you to sin in this body. And 1 Corinthians 3.17 says, If any man defile the temple of God, which is your body, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find a pasture. That sh that's how this book reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the door. And he says, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So the book of Nehemiah records the rebuilding and description of the walls of Jerusalem and its citizenship the book has 13 chapters, 406 verses, 10,483 words. And as you know, Nehemiah takes place after the 70-year Babylonian captivity. The Jews were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, and for 70 years they were in captivity. Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. His name means Jehovah Comforts. He had a high position as the servant of the king. However, Nehemiah was more heavenly minded, and you'll see that he ends up dedicating his life to serving the heavenly king. But he was the king's cupbearer, so before the king would drink anything, Nehemiah had to taste it first in case someone poisoned it or something. But in chapter 1, Nehemiah is in great mourning because the Jews that were left of the captivity are in great affliction. The walls of Jerusalem were burned down and the gates burned with fire. And I told you that Ezra is a Bible man, but Nehemiah is a prayer warrior. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, it says, And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. So you see, Nehemiah's character. You already see this man has a great character. And in chapter 2 you see Nehemiah, as he goes before the king. In chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of Artic Xerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very afraid. You see, Nehemiah was very afraid because you weren't supposed to come before the king with a sad, sad countenance. But Nehemiah did. He was sad about what was going on with God's people and Jerusalem. Now verse 3 and 4, it says, And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. So the king's asking him what his request is, and Nehemiah sends up a quick prayer. So notice Nehemiah is such a prayer warrior that he sends up a quick prayer on the spot to get wisdom from God on what to say to the king. This is known by many as a Nehemiah prayer. And I've been in situations 
before when someone was looking me dead in the eye and they wanted an answer and I quickly said, help me, Lord. Or have you ever been up teaching and you forget what you were going to say and you just say, help me, Lord, and it comes right back to you. And I say out of all these hours I've spent reading and studying, surely the answer is in your brain somewhere. And the Lord can pull that out of your brain really fast if you send up a quick Nehemiah prayer. And John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So this prayer works. Send up a quick Nehemiah prayer. God may just help you remember something. Nehemiah 2, 5, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me into Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. So the king lets him go. And Nehemiah leaves his good job to go serve God. All he needed was for the Lord to put that one person in his life to get him in a situation where he could serve God easier. The Lord will sometimes put a person in your life to help you get in that position, or you can be the person to put someone else in that position. But Nehemiah goes out to inspect Jerusalem's walls, and these two enemies of the work of God, Sanballat and Tobiah, hear about what's going on, and they immediately start plotting how they can end the work of the Lord. And many people will never do anything for God, but they will make sure they work to keep you from doing any work for God. Nehemiah 2.10, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So, you see, you got people out there who it just kills them if they see somebody else doing something for the Lord or for God's people. So, Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words they had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Even today, if you're born again, you have no excuse not to begin working with your hands doing something for God. Going to church three times a week is good, but if that is all you do, then you're not working with your hands. Notice in verse 18, he says, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. And what is Paul always saying? Work with your own hands. You know, you need to do something for God. Get some type of ministry. And as I said, this, this book reminds us how we need to build uh, something around our temple, which is our body. Build a hedge around your temple with prayer, Bible reading. Get to work on living for God. Now verse 19, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Who cares if the world laughs because God will get the last laugh. And he who laughs last laughs best. They laughed at Nehemiah, but God is going to get the last laugh. He said in Proverbs 126, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. So when somebody laughs at you, just don't even worry about it. Verse 20 then answered I them and said unto them, the, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we as servants will arise and build, but you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Notice that Nehemiah could not be moved. He was a prayer warrior and a rough character in the Bible. In chapter 3 you see the rebuilding of the wall. And the book of Nehemiah begins to start talking about all these gates. All these gates are pictures of something they show you a truth first you see in nehemiah 3 1 the sheep gate and here in nehemiah 3 1 this sheep gate reminds you of the lord jesus christ because he was the lamb slain notice that the gate is sanctified it says they sanctified it it's set apart and also notice this gate 
unlike the other gates, doesn't have locks and bars. You could go in this gate with no problem, just like you can get in Jesus Christ freely. There's nothing trying to keep you out. Jesus want, is wanting you to come in. He says, whosoever will, come. So this sheep gate pictures salvation offered freely through Jesus Christ. And then the next gate shows you about living the sanctified life. In Nehemiah 3.3, 3, it talks about the fish gate. And this reminds you of soul winning. And if you're a soul winner, then you're a fisher of men. And this is the fish gate. And soul winning is something you do if you're living a sanctified life after you get saved. But it's the fish gate. And Jesus told the disciples, what did he tell them? He says, I will make you to become fishers of men in Mark 1, 17. So you need to get, start going fishing. Proverbs eleven thirty: the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Are you getting people saved? Are you attempting to get them saved? Nehemiah 3, 6, you have another gate, which is the old gate. And this old gate reminds us of the old paths. In Jeremiah 6, 16, it says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. And I love that song about sticking with the old stuff, because I don't want the new Bibles. I don't want the new Christian rock CDs. I don't want the new teachings that are against the Bible. I don't want to hear or tell some new thing. The old way is better. Reading to some church history and what these other people did, try to start doing the good things that they did. But that is the old gate. Next, you see the valley gate. In Nehemiah 3.13, you have the valley gate. This reminds you that in the Christian life, you will go through valleys and hard times. A faithful Christian will come through it without giving up and leaning on God through the valley. If you lean on God, He's going to get you through it. And next, in that same verse, you see the dung gate. And in verse 14, you see the dung gate. This gate should remind you to take out the trash in your life. Lay aside every weight and sin with death, so which death so easily besets you. Many Christians are walking around carrying a trash bag on their back full of sin, and they can't go on for God because they refuse to confess and forsake their sin and get the trash off their back. So that's the dung gate. And next you see the fountain gate. In Nehemiah 3.15, But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalom, the son of Kolhozi, the ruler of part of Mizpah, and he built it and covered it and set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof and the wall of the pool of Siloa by the king's garden and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. That is the fountain gate. And what, what would that remind you of? That reminds me of there is a fountain filled with blood. It reminds me of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shed his blood for us on the cross. And next you have the water gate. That's Nehemiah 3.26. What does that remind you of? Jesus Christ is the living water. When he died on the cross for our sins and the soldier pierced him in his side, out came blood and water. Uh, Jesus Christ washes you with the water of the word. He cleanses you that way. Wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to that word. And next you have the horse gate. What does that remind you of? Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And Jesus Christ is on a white horse and so are we. Then you have the east gate and the gate Mifkad. And in chapter 4 you see Sanballat and Tobiah are at it again, going against the people of God. They don't want you to build these gates. You see, all the gates, you may not see it how I see it. They, remind, they may remind you of something different about your Christian life or, or something else in the Bible, but... 
the, these, these enemies of God don't want you building the gates. They don't want you having anything to do with things associated with the Bible. And there's, with these gates, there's more than one thing that can be, that I've heard or seen other people use as pictures and types of the gates. But just sit and think about what each gate reminds you of in your Christian life. In chapter 4, you see Sanballat and Tobiah are at it again, going against the people of God. They don't want them building. But it, in Nehemiah 4 and verse 6, it says, So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Christians today need a mind to work and a mind to work together. You have all of these different camps of Bible believers. Imagine if they stopped hating each other and joined forces to go against the real enemies of God. And I'm not talking about Bible believers joining forces with Church of Christ or Pentecostal or something like that. I'm talking about people who believe the Bible, believe the right gospel. Instead of fighting each other, turn around and fight the real enemy and quit using friendly fire. Look at all the things that could be accomplished. Now look at Nehemiah 4, 7, and 8. It says, And it came to pass that when Sinbalat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Notice the conspiracy. And I believe in conspiracies because people are always conspiring against the Lord. They don't want the Lord's work to be done. And in Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now it came to pass, when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plains of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief, and I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease, whilst I leave it and come down to you? So Nehemiah wasn't stupid. He knew when someone was trying to trick him. They were trying to get him to stop doing the work. He wasn't ignorant of the devil's devices. He knew that through good words and fair speeches that men deceived the hearts of the simple. He knew that even the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety and that people's minds could be corrupted. He knew that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. And so he says to these enemies of God, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? And he probably knew right off the bat because... They they said that they're going to go in the villages in the plain of Oh No. So when the people of the devil try to get you to to uh, do something you shouldn't to go against the work of God, that's usually the phrase that pops in your mind is Oh No, and that's exactly where they're wanting to take him, the plains of Oh No. So don't let nobody stop the work that you have going on, even if they think they have a better way for you to do it. Even if they say, Let's not, that's not what you're supposed to be doing, you know from what God showed you with the Bible what you're supposed to be doing. And all these guys do is come up with false accusations, these enemies of God, which is one of the last day's signs in 2 Timothy 3. Do you know why men do this? It's because if they can't find any uncleanness in a man when they examine him, they then have to dig up dirt. And if they can't dig up dirt, then they'll throw dirt on you their self they'll throw dirt on your name nehemiah 6 and verse 7 and thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at jerusalem saying there is a king in judah and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words come now therefore and let us take counsel together then i sent unto him saying there are no such things done as thou sayest but thou feignest them out of thine heart so they are making stuff up to try and make Nehemiah look bad. They're false accusers. And Nehemiah also knew a great biblical truth. In Proverbs 29, 25, he said, the, uh, the Proverbs said, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. 
So Nehemiah wasn't afraid of their false accusations. He said they feigned these things out of their own heart. Now, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 10. Afterward, I came into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mahetabil, who was shut up, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee, and who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life, I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Therefore was he hired, that I should be afraid and do so and sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report, that they may they might reproach me. My God, thank thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So men want to scare you, so that they can control you. But Nehemiah wasn't about to let them scare him. In Matthew 10, 28, it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear God, and that's it. 2 Timothy 1, 17 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. 1 John 4, 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So the only thing you should fear is God. And if you fear God, then you don't have to fear anything else. You can be so fearful that you're tormented by whatever you're fearful of. Nehemiah feared God and not these men that were trying to stop the work of God. In verse 15 in Nehemiah 6, it tells you that the wall is finished. And you can see that Nehemiah is still getting letters from the enemies of God trying to put him in fear. This is just a tactic of God's enemies. You can see even in 2 Thessalonians 2 how men were pretending to be Paul and sending false letters to the Thessalonians. And Paul tells them not to be shaken in mind because of these false letters. And notice Nehemiah's brothers share the same characteristic as Nehemiah in Nehemiah 7. 1 through 2, it says, Now it came to pass when the wall was built, and I set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed that I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. So they fear God, just like Nehemiah. They fear God above many. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So if you have a good father, then you know he is there to protect you and provide for you and take care of you. However, you fear him. You fear him enough to obey him because he will chasten you with a belt or a paddle or whatever else if you go against him. And that's the way it is with the Lord. He loves you, he'll take care of you, but he will chasten you. And great men in the Bible fear the heavenly father. In chapter 7, you also have a list of people who returned from being in exile in Babylon to Jerusalem. In chapter 8, Ezra shows up to read the book of the law. In Nehemiah 8, 1 through 3, it says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man to the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. So this is what they did before Alexander's score became out. Before Alexander Scorby came out with the uh, audio Bible, Ezra, the Bible man, would read out of the book of the law from morning to midday. And I guarantee you he didn't have such a hard time pronouncing things as I'm, I'm having. Uh, he's pronouncing all the names right, and the people were attentive. And if you was to get up and read a chapter today, the people would fall asleep before you're done with the chapter. But these people, like Ezra, loved the word of god 
Nehemiah 8.4, And Ezra the scribe stood up on a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the, pur this, the purpose. This is where you get the idea for a pulpit. Only Ezra is standing on it, and today we stand behind it. Although I have seen preachers stand on the pulpit sometimes when they get really into it. Uh, Nehemiah 8.5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. This is why some preachers have you stand up as they read. You ever been in church and he says, Stand up as we read the word of God. That's where he gets that from. Nehemiah 8, 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So notice in the Bible, when people worship, they go forwards and not backwards. Unlike the Benny Hinn meetings. Now verse 8. So they read in the book, and the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. So that's what you do when you preach or teach. You read the book, preach the word, let people know what the words mean. M make known the sense, as you see Ezra do. Now verses 10 through 12, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. So having a good dinner and the fellowship hall after preaching time is biblical. These people were going to eat dinner after hearing the word of God morning and through midday. Now, Nehemiah 9, 1 through 3. Now, on the 20 and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth, sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the lord their god so notice that acknowledging and confessing your sin is connected with reading the book if you can get a man interested in this bible to the point where he will read it and study it every day you will knock out more sin in his life than one thousand sermons on sin will do hard preaching is good and that's what we need but there also has to be a balance to where you teach someone how to get in the book themselves when they're not listening to you preach. You can give them a drink of water on Sunday, but if you show them the fountain, if you show them how to get to the fountain, they can go it to themselves and get something every day out of it, and this will knock sin out of their life. Because the saying is true, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. But this has just been a, a short overview of Nehemiah. Maybe I help whet your appetite for this book. Just go and read it. Uh, Nehemiah is a great man. I think he's a prayer warrior. And like I said, this book pictures sanctification after you, your body becomes the temple. It pictures getting the outer man fixed. And like I said, if any man defile the temple of God... Him shall God destroy. Just go through this book. Look at those gates. See what those gates remind you of or what you think they're a picture of. What, I, what they reminded me of but may be something completely different than what they remind you of. But read the Word of God. See what you can get out of it. And just love reading the Word of God every day because this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book.